welcome once again to one more episode of Concepts of Editing. We're talking about the creative role of the editor. Now, we've gone into several very complicated issues in the last session. So if you have any questions, please shoot. Mm. Sir, I do have a question. Uh, when two creative minds get together, like the director and the editor, don't you think that there would be certain conflicts among them? Well, that's a real humdinger of a question. Can one of you answer him and I'll join in? What is, what is your opinion? Repeat the question, please. Um, when two creative minds get together, like the editor and the director, don't you think that there should be certain conflicts among them? There is likely to be conflicts, I believe. Is it healthy or unhealthy? What do you think? That would depend on the situation. So don't you think there was something that you must know? Film is a professional activity, whether it's video or cinema. You must see that finally the film is made. It should not lead to a kind of deadlock by which the film is not made. Do you agree? So somewhere someone has to give way. Healthy conflict. I think that finally the director's word will hold. But in certain cases, the editor might come up with some brilliant suggestions. Like, for example, let me mention one of the greatest editors, living editors in the world today. And his name is Walter Murch. Walter Murch, M-U-R-C-H, one of the great editors of the world, a real creative editor. He is not only a film editor, he's also a sound editor. He is one editor who's done it all, from the linear to the non-linear. He started off with the Moviola, worked on the Moviola, and um, then he worked on the Steenbeck, and then he's done linear editing, and then he's done non-linear, working on the Avid, and now he works on the FCP, the Final Cut Pro. I had the occasion to meet him, in fact, in Pune at the Film and Television Institute of India, where he had come to lecture, and he showed us some of the films that he had edited, among which was the famous Apocalypse Now by, who's the director of Apocalypse Francis Now? Francis Ford Coppola. Correct, Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now, edited by Walter Murch. And he's edited several of uh, Coppola's films, including The Godfather and The Godfather Part Two, And he's also done uh, The English Patient, a very famous Oscar-winning film by Anthony Minghella. Uh, one of the very famous films that he showed was a film called The Unbearable Likeness of Being. Do you know the author of this book, the book on which this film is based, The Unbearable Likeness of Being? It's written by a Czech author called Milan Kundera. And uh, he said that when he edits, initially the director sits for a time. And then the director leaves. Or he could be sitting in a corner but not saying anything. After he's done a rough cut of a certain scene, he shows it to the director. And then the director and the editor agree. They may differ, as you say. There might be areas of conflict and contact. And finally, a synthesis is achieved. Almost like a Hegelian dialectic mod model. You know, there's a thesis, there's an antithesis. And there's a synthesis. This new synthesis, by virtue of it being a thesis, has an antithesis. The new synthesis and the new antithesis unite to form a new synthesis. So it should be a question of synthesis between the director and the editor, as has been the case with Francis Ford Coppola and Walter Murch. Any other question? Um, can you say something about the Hollywood studio system with respect to editing? OK, again, a complicated question. I feel that what you're asking is how independent were the directors because the studio system dictated a kind of division of labor. And you know that in the studio years, basically the 30s, 40s, 50s, and also the 60s, there was this constant tension between genre and auteur. You know, in trying to create a genre, do you know what a genre is? A Any style, a particular style. A style, a type, like the musical, like the detective film, like the thriller, and so on. In trying to create a genre like the Wild West, the studio bosses, big bosses of MGM, you know, like Sam Goldwyn, people like that, you know, uh, Cecil B. DeMille, they employed writers who would do brainstorming, and that was one section. They employed directors who would direct on the floor, and they would be cameramen along with the directors. Then they employed editors. And the editors would edit 
independently. So your question becomes very relevant. The studio bosses would insist that the director not come to the editing. Can you believe it? This is the tension between genre and auteur. The auteur is an author, right? An author is someone who has complete creative control in all departments of cinema. If you are an auteur, you really didn't have a place in the studio system, as Orson Welles found out to his dismay. You know, the cut of Magnificent Ambersons, his second film after Citizen Kane, was done by the studios, and he didn't like it. So that is the problem. This is a problem which, you know, we in India often face a producer, like uh, sometimes some of these big production houses, we have Ram Gopal Varma, big production house. Not only does he direct, he also employs others. So he may be exercising some creative control and may come into the editing you know, machine where the editing machine is situated. So this is a tension which always develops. Is the director to be there or not? In my opinion, there are no rights and wrongs. But generally, because the director has created something, it is only right that he be present during the editing. Although the editor, being completely independent, would have a very unbiased view. And he could make certain suggestions which the director never thought of at all. Any other questions? Mm, sir, another question is, uh, can we say that the classical Hollywood system was equivalent to the assembly line in production? To some extent, yes. In fact, the best example of this assembly line can be found in the comedies. Mm -hmm. You know, when the comedies were being produced, first it was uh, the producers like uh, Max Sennett, who employed Charlie Chaplin. You know, they were the keystone cops uh, of which Max Sennett was a part. Then he became a producer with, with Hal Walsh. And uh, there was Charlie Chaplin, Buster, Buster Keaton, Keaton, Harold Lloyd, Harry Langdon, Fatty Harry Arbuckle, Arbuckle, and uh, several, Laurel and Hardy. And those were prepared almost assembly line. But the writers were so good that they created gags, you know, which were really out of the world. Much later, when the Pink Panther series came into being, with Blake Edwards directing, we had uh, this marvelous creation of Peter Sellers called Inspector Clouseau, you know, a French the officer, Pink you know, the Pink Panther series in Scotland Yard. So, well, it was assembly line, but sometimes it was successful. What's the difference between point of view shot and subjective shot? Right. This is a confusion which many people have. People confuse the two. People think that when you look at something, and I show you that thing, the shot that I'm taking is a point of view shot. That is wrong. When I look at something and my cut shows it to you, that is known as an eye line match. Please note, that's an eye line match. When I look at something and my cut shows it to you, that's an eye line match. A subjective shot, on the other hand, is the camera taking the place of the character seeing. And these subjective shots could be static, but they are often more effective when they are moving. For example, there is a very important subjective shot in Alfred Hitchcock's film Frenzy. You know, this film Frenzy came in the 70s. It's one of his later films. Once again, there's a mysterious killer who's been killing women in uh, London. And there is one scene in which it is the killer who's entering a house, and you don't see him, but you see the camera approximating the killer, and that's a subjective shot. Another very famous subjective shot is in Charulata. In the Pule Pule song, when uh, Madhubi playing Charu is on the swing, you find that the camera is also on the swing. And you see how when the swing moves, the camera also moves and the floor, you can get the floor. That is a subjective shot. So the camera taking the place of the person, but a point of view shot is a point of view of the person watching but the person who is watching is also suggested. Let me repeat. In a point of view shot, the difference from a subjective shot is that the camera approximates the position of the viewer, but the viewer is also seen in suggestion. Now, may I ask you a question before I move to any other question that you might have? Give me an example of a point of view shot. Taking the example from Psycho, uh, by uh, Alfred Hitchcock, uh, we can see uh, the female protagonist 
uh, going towards uh, Norman Bates house uh, one of the character from Psycho right and that, that female th was Marion Crane played by Janet Lee <laughs> yes okay and we can see the female prot protagonist uh, as you said Marion Crane uh, moving towards his house we see that the camera is following his uh, her vision but is she seen also in the shot? She no, has no. no. Then it's not a point of view shot. That's a sub subjective shot. Mm -hmm. In a point of view shot, you will see her vision and you will see her also. Mm -hmm. Give me an example. I just showed you in the earlier session of a particular kind of shot in which you see what you are seeing and we see you also. Give me that example. Over the shoulder shot. Correct. Excellent. That's a very good answer. Over the shoulder shots are examples of point of view shots. It's very important that you identify these shots because editing means shot breakdowns. So you must know the shot breakdown in order to be an editor. Now, any other questions or anything else? Yes, sir, I have a question. Can you name some of the transitions that have come down from the classical era apart from the cut? You mean right down from the silent uh, era? Yes, silent era. Well, of course, you know the cut. Then there's the dissolve. There's the fade in. There's the fade out. There's the wipe. There's the iris in, there's the iris out. Can anyone tell me what is an iris in and iris out? What kind of a shot is this? This is the shape of an eye. It's from One shot out, becomes an eye and becomes a point, point, and then from that point it becomes an eye and out. Truffaut uses many of these to pay homage to the silent masters. In the video era now, we have so many kinds of wipes, you know. There are millions of wipes which are available in the nonlinear system if you use an AVID or an FCP or a DPS velocity. Even in the linear systems, we used to get lots of wipes. The traditional wipe was one shot wiping out another, one shot pushing out another. It was known as a push. Slide. Now we have the slide. We have, you know, one shot slicing another, a circular wipe, you know, one shot, you know, cutting the whole frame into four parts mirror wipes, all kinds of crazy wipes used in corporate films because video has really come in. Talking about video, uh, when you talked about the point of view and the subject you shot, I wanted to mention the imaginary line once again and mention that now with video coming in in a big way, with television holding sway and with the coverage of sports events, this imaginary line becomes very important. The idea is you should never confuse the viewer. So when we see a match in progress, a football match and a cricket match, generally the imaginary line is maintained. And also the screen direction is maintained. For example, when a diver dives from a board and you see another shot as she hits the water, if you go to the opposite side, then it will confuse the audience. Therefore, even if there are four or five or six cameras, they all maintain the imaginary line. Consider this to be a studio. The three cameras are all maintaining the line. They're on one side. They're not crossing the axis. So that's why the imaginary line is very important. I would like to ask one question. That's, can you once again define a dissolve? Now, a dissolve is a mix. It's also called a mix. Like in audio, we use the word mix. A visual mix is a dissolve. It may be defined, and you may note, a dissolve may be precisely defined as the superimposition of a fade in upon a fade out. One shot very slowly fades out and even as it is fading out, the next shot which is to come in is fading in. Now, I use the word superimposition. This may also be another effect. In the lab, we call these optical effects. Please note optical effects. But when you have a vision mixer or when you have your nonlinear apparatus, then you can use the superimposition without calling it an optical because it's a video effect. Can you tell me what is a superimposition? One, one picture overlapping over another. Yes, one picture upon another. This is also called layering. There's one layer and there's another layer. So, in a superimposition, you may have two or three layers. The nonlinear facilities, which we will talk about in future, they give this option of complete layering. You might have 
let's say, a, a music video. And music videos are very common. These music videos have several layers. You have one layer of visual and superimposed is another layer. So that's also another effect. Earlier in the episode, you talked about the Japanese director Yasujiro Ozu. Um, you said that he has a non-classical approach to his editing. Why? Okay, uh, that's a difficult question. I'll try to answer it. I'm not an expert on Ozu, but uh, I've seen his films and I've read about him and I had the opportunity to see a very interesting film, which if you get the opportunity to see, you must. It's called Tokyo Ga. Tokyo Ga is a film by a German director called Wim Wenders. And in this film, he analyzes the art and the craft of Ozu. Why do I say that he has a non-classical approach to editing? It's not only I who say it. There are several other writers, like uh, in the book Baldwin and Thompson. He also says that Ozu has a non-classical approach to film. Then there is a famous filmmaker called Paul Schrader, who's also a screenplay writer, who's written a book called Transcendental Cinema, in which he talks about the cinema of Bresson, Ozu, and Drea. You must read this book, Transcendental Cinema. And here, too, he says that Ozu has a non-classical approach. Now, what is the classical approach? As I've already reiterated several times, Hollywood believes in the system which is known as Decoupage Classique. This system believes in seamless transitions. You don't even feel that there is an editor. The editing has been done, but you don't feel it. Invisible editing has taken place. You follow the narrative, that is, the story. The editing is always geared towards hiding itself and expressing the story, communicating the story. That is the classical approach. But in Yasujiro Ozu's cinema, I'm talking about his cinema first, and then I'll come to his editing. It's not the narrative which is of prime importance. It's not a particular episode which is very important. Ozu de-emphasizes and de-centers certain events so that more unique cinematic configurations can come to the fore. You understand? This is where he's non-classical. You know, the events might lead to a climax. Let's say in Tokyo's story, there are certain events which are leading up to the grandmother's death. And then when the death is to come, that's the climactic event. That is not shown at all. There is an ellipsis. Do you know what is an ellipsis, anyone? An ellipsis or an elliptic cut is when you go over a particular event, you don't show it at all. You were approaching that event, and when that event came, you didn't show it at all. So the event which was supposed to be climactic is not shown at all. So therefore, he's non-classical. Not only that, he doesn't believe in always keeping the viewer settled. Therefore, he violates the imaginary line. He doesn't work on a 180-degree axis. He works in a 360-degree space. But he uses match cuts again. You don't feel that there is a jerk in the cuts, even though he crosses the line, because he's matching in movement. And not only is he matching in movement, he is showing the background. If the background is shown, then the jerk is not so much. You can see that the camera has moved to the other side, much in the fashion of the last shot of the train sequence in Pothir Panchali. When you can see that the camera has moved the other side in Opu and Durga coming towards the camera. So that's why I say Yasujiro Ozu, who does several things, he places the camera 
at a low angle in a position that one would be if one was seated on a tatami mat. He rarely moves the camera. He used to in his earlier films, but by the time he came to autumn afternoon, he rarely moved the camera. And he has this uniquely oriental meditative philosophy, which he expresses in his film. That's why I say his editing is non-classical. If you look at Robert Bresson, his pacing again in films like Mouchette, in Hwaza Balthazar, in, in films like um, The Diary of a Country Priest, or The Pickpocket, or A Man Escaped, quite different. Bresson, again, has a completely different sensibility. And uh, without talking too much about Bresson, because it's really not relevant to this class, I'd just like to mention that his editing style is dictated by his own unique philosophy. He belongs to a class of Christians who call themselves Jansenists and who believe that they are certainly possessed of certain artistic and intellectual faculties. And indeed they are. And Bresson has given us some marvelous works of art. His style totally denies the role of theater and of acting. He believes that the performers are just models who will carry out his exercises. And he might take 15 or 16 takes of a shot and then say that the shot is okay. If you ask him, why did you take so many takes? Take three look just as good or take four. Why do you select take 16? This is an editor's job to select a take. Presso would say, by the grace of St. Augustine. Now, what does this mean? To someone not really well versed in Christian mythology, this might be a mystery. Actually, from what I have gathered from an interaction with Kumar Shahani, one of our leading filmmakers, who was an apprentice to Bresso for some time, um, what Bresso means is that he wants to kill the spirit of the actors before okaying a take. You know, whenever an actor comes onto the floor, he comes with a great deal of enthusiasm. He wants to give his all. That's what Bresso doesn't want. He wants them to just be models, to just behave according to the text. Because he says, the moment you give an accent or an expression, you reveal your roots. And I want you to be naked before God. I don't want to know your educational background. I don't want to know where you come from. So Bresso, in everything that he does, has a non-classical approach. So let's look closer home. And very quickly, before I conclude, look at some of the filmmakers here and their editors. I've already told you that Walter Murch one of the greatest living editors who's worked with Francis Ford Coppola. Now you tell me, I'll give you a short quiz here. Who was Shotojit Rai's editor? You tell me, just one person answer. Do you know? Dural Dutta. Dural Dutta, correct. Who was Rinal Sen's editor? Anyone knows? No. He initially began with a gentleman called Gongadhar Noshkor. But later on, when the Steenbeck came, he switched on to another gentleman called Mrinmoy Chakraborty. So these are famous editors, you know, Mrinmoy Chakraborty, Gongadhar Noshkar, uh, Dulal Dotto, who was Rithik Ghatok's editor, Ramesh Joshi, famous editor. Can you name some editors who have become filmmakers? Rishikesh Mukherjee. Yes, Rishikesh Mukherjee was a very famous editor. He worked with Bimal Roy, and he's become a filmmaker. Name one very famous filmmaker, a great showman as he's called, who also used to edit his films. Shubhash Bhai. Subhash Gai is not an editor. Someone else who was the other great showman before Subhash Gai. Raj Kapoor. Oh, yeah. Raj Kapoor used to edit. He had his own studios, the RK Studios in Chembur. Now, if you look at the work of these editors, particularly the work of Ramesh Joshi, Ritwik Ghatak, you'll find a great deal of creativity going into the editing. The way shots are used. You'll find Eisensteinian elements, You'd find wholly Indian elements, and you'll find a great deal of psychology in the use of sound effects. I did mention the use of psychological sound in one of Rithik's films. Do you recall? Yes, the yes. Me in Megata Katara, the better hour sequence. Yes, you mean the whiplash yeah. sounds, the whipping. It's the conscience being whipped. Can you tell me where exactly this occurs? Give me the sequence. Mm, the one Robindo Shongi is going on is called. No, that's later. That's later. That's later. But tell me what happened. When does the wish whiplash actually come? And in whose mind does it come? Actually, it's in, um, I think, Nita's mind. Yes. After she sees her sister yeah. with a man whom she considered to be her lover, 
and she feels this whipping of her conscience. And it's the story of how, how Nita is cornered by the circumstances, by the spirit of the times, by her own near and dear, you know, complete subjugation by the forces and the elements. And yet she is a mother figure, an archetypal figure, who is, in a sense, controlling the family, but against her will, she is herself, you know, uh, she is gradually wearing away, getting eroded. This whole theme, combined with the theme of transmigration, which was Rithik's great dream, because, you know, he was actually uprooted from his soil, combines to give you a great work of art. And in that work of art, the putting together is so important, that is the editing. So in Rithik's films, editing, in, say, Shuborno Rekha, in Bari Theke Palie, in films like Tita Shekti Dodi Naam, in which shots are kept on for some time, long shots. Jukti Takko Gappu. Jukti Takko Gappu, which is, in a sense, eclectic and eccentric. Shots are cut at random, somewhat like Goddard. It's very, very, very strange and interesting. I think today's class has been extremely enlightening, both for you and for me, because I get... I feel that teaching is a learning experience. I learn from your questions. Please make it a point to see some of the films that I mentioned. I'll recap. Definitely see Shotrit Rai's Pothir Pachali again and again. And try to analyze the editing patterns. See Hitchcock's films. You mentioned Psycho. See if you can get Frenzy, if it's possible. Antonio Nis, you mentioned The Eclipse. If you can't get The Eclipse, at least get The Night. And see Ozu's films. You know, films like The Autumn Afternoon, Tokyo Story and try and analyze where the cuts come. Now when you see a film in the auditorium, try and feel the cut. I saw a film called Parinita yesterday, and I was trying to feel where the cut is used, where the dissolve is used, where it is effective and where it is not effective. So think of some more questions to ask me. We'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.